All right, Madison, we're back with the Inkle Podcast. All right, who are we talking to today? Today we've got a friend of mine on. Her name is Megan Stubbs Vera. Specifically, she and I want to talk about the Beyonce movie, Renaissance. And with that, let's get to it. Megan Stubbs Vera, welcome to the Inqua Podcast. Thanks for coming on. Let's talk a little bit about what you love about movies. Have you always loved movies? And then dig into something that you're an expert on that I am not. And then finish talking about some movies that are just your, your favorites of all time. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Redlands, California, um, which is about an hour and a half east of L.A., somewhere Inland Empire. It's the jewel of the Inland Empire, actually, I might say. I was born in Charleston, South Carolina, but I've always like we moved to Southern California when I was like six months old. So I'm definitely a California gal. Now, when everyone asked, did you always just tell them L.A.? No, actually, really? but I have some people who do that and we're, I just, I never really went to LA till I was like 18. So <laughs> I would never, it's like, we don't live in LA. When I was growing up there, it's all like, there was a lot of farmland, which is now like targets and shopping centers, but homey was a great place to grow up, but I do love living in LA. And now I call LA home because I've been here for a long time. Well, I appreciate the honest. Every time I've gone through Redlands, I think about you. There's a Sonic there, right? There is, and there was mm-hmm. not one there before. So wow. everyone is getting a much better Redlands than I used to get. But it's still <laughs> very charming. It was very cute. <laughs> They're just trying to bring you back is all. You know, it works, actually. <laughs> so you didn't come to L.A. much, but did you have an affinity for movies and TV growing up? Definitely. Definitely love to go. We would go to Hollywood Video oh, yeah. to rent movies. And I really preferred that over Blockbuster because they had a lot of old movie musicals. Yep. And that young 12 to 16 year old Megan was digging deep into the old like 40s, 50s, 60s musicals. So that's kind of where it all began for me. But as I've gotten older, I've continued to like expand the types of films that I watch and I love it. I love getting on my letterbox and like writing my little review. And it's just for me. I'm not trying to impress anybody else, but I love like documenting what I've seen and seeing what my, I don't even have that many friends on there, but I love like seeing what my brothers have watched and what you've watched. And it's just fun. I was going to say, I always check. And if I've seen you've watched it or given it a star, I'm like, okay, now I got to know. Good. I'm glad I can influence you. (laughs) So old, old classic musicals. Did things change when you moved to L.A.? Did it did it change you at all? Or were you watching more artsy stuff? Yes. Yeah, I think I got a lot more artsy. I think it was L.A. I'm trying to think of because for I actually like lived in Utah for a while after I graduated from school. And I think. I got more artsy in LA because it's just kind of the vibe. And also there's a lot more access. Like I would see, I love all the billboards showing all the shows coming out, all the movies coming out. Cause you see stuff that I probably wouldn't hear about sometimes. And then there's also like the cool indie theaters and actually one of the movies for later that I wanted to talk about is one, like I had to drive to Pasadena to go see. But I'd seen a little trailer and I was like, I got to go see this movie. So I love like all the access that we have. Whereas in other places, they either don't get some of the movies we get at all or they get them way later. And I just like have no concept of that. (laughs) Yep. Once you've been here enough years, you're like, hasn't everyone seen insert indie movie title here? It's like, no, no, it doesn't release until November. It's January. Okay. (laughs) Now, you know. Yeah. And even like the new Beverly Cinema, you know, Tarantino's Theater, like that. Just being, I think that's how I've actually, like a lot of the movies I wrote, because I had a hard time choosing what we were going to talk about at the end, are ones I've seen either at like the new Beverly or. (laughs) There's something about the feeling when you watch a movie that just cements it at like a certain period of time or who you're with or whatever, that somehow makes it more. I will say it can polish movies that maybe aren't the greatest, but can also just like make a movie that's already really good, just that much more special, right? That's true. So what, well, okay, yeah, let's talk about music too. So you grew up loving movies, loving old musicals. Where were you with music growing up? I loved 
all kinds of music. I had a really weird collection of CDs at our house because my dad worked at Radio Shack for a time. Or not Radio Shack, Circuit City. Oh, so classic. He had all these random CDs that sometimes my mom also listened to, but a lot of the times like it was just me. So there was a lot of Michael Jackson, a lot of Janet Jackson, but then there was also like Richard Marks and the Judds. And then I was an, I grew up an only child. And so I actually watched a lot of MTV that I don't think that they knew I was doing. So I actually really got into hip hop too. So like wow. I was probably in fifth grade and I knew all the words to shoot by Salt and Peppa. So I all and that like the hip hop genre, the R and B genre, like nineties R and B is perfection. And so those have always stayed with me too. And then I like fell in love with Barbara Streisand. I love musicals. Like, and then I grew up in the nineties. So Nirvana, Offspring, like it's just like all over, all over the town is where I go when it comes to music. Now it's led me to my next question though. When did you first listen to Beyonce? This is a great part of my life. So I first heard, I will, I, I remember it. I remember my friend's room. I remember where her CD player was and she had the Destiny's Child CD that was, I think it was actually their second album, The Writings on the Wall, but that's the one when they really popped. Yeah. And I heard Bills, Bills, Bills. And that was it. Like, that was it. I was like, this is everything to me. And so I've been a Destiny's Child fan from day one, therefore a Beyonce fan. When she went solo with her Dangerously in Love album, I was shopping at Walmart with my grandma, my sweet, like <laughs> conservative grandma. And first, I think they had CDs in the checkout aisle and it was, it, they had that album. And if you know it, she's like looking beautiful with her arm extended and her hair blowing and this like, just like crystals over her chest. And I couldn't stop looking at it. I was just like, but not holding it. I just was looking at it. And then my grandma said, do you want that? I'll buy it for you. And I said, really? See, that's how I got my first Beyonce album. And then it's honest, like, I love her so much. And I've followed everything to this day. So I do think you chose the right person to talk to you about the Renaissance film. Yeah, I mean, as soon as it came out, I was like, i got to talk to Megan because I didn't have time to see it between going and out of town and things like that. It's been on my list. I'm like, I hope it goes streaming somewhere, Ugh. but I knew you would see it. I didn't get to see it opening night, but I did okay. see it on December 2nd or was it the third? I saw it the Saturday after it came out. Opening weekend. Yeah. Middle of the day. Cause I was like, I have to see this in IMAX. I need to see Beyonce as huge as possible. Yep. Went to Century City. Got our tickets months in advance, dressed up. I wore my little silver jacket. <laughs> and it was great. And then I actually saw it a second time. I think it was December 29th. I was in Utah. My little brother wanted to go see it because he no one, no one else wanted to go see it with him. And at now in Utah, I don't know now, today, but at that time it was only showing. They live in Ogden. It was only showing in South Jordan at 9.45 p.m. at night. And we did it. We, we had to make a strategic plan. Went to the Nickel Cave to kill some time. And then we went to South Jordan and watched Beyonce. Didn't get home till like 2 in the morning. It was great. That's dedication <laughs> right there. It is. <laughs> it is. Okay, so you, you had already listened to the album, right? Because the album came out before the movie. Yeah, yeah. It came out last, or it came out in 2022. 22, that's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you already loved it. What were your expectations for the Renaissance film? For the film or for the concert? Because I also oh, wanted the concert. Oh, let's talk about both then. Okay, for the concert and then the film. So I've seen, prior to this, I'd seen Beyonce four times in concert, different tours. She's incredible. So I knew that this was going to be like blow us out of the water. So there was a lot of hype, a lot of buzz going into it. And you know, when you're a diehard fan and you, I, you, I don't know about you, 
but I follow quite a few like Beyonce fan pages who are also okay. so there was almost like a countdown to when the tour started even though we weren't you know it started in Europe I think in May maybe mm-hmm. even April like we weren't gonna see it till we went in September but it was like so exciting <laughs> I was like so excited for it to start and like to see some of her outfits but I did not want to be spoiled like I when I go to a concert I don't like looking up the track list before yeah. like I love because she's really good at weaving in older songs with current songs and even if it's just like a sample of her own song or just like a little bit of a melody that transitions it's just so fun to be surprised by it and I was so I did a really good job, even though I saw a lot of her outfits. That was exciting, but I would not watch videos. Yeah. And I didn't even know the order of things. So going to the tour in September was like the energy, the hype, everyone outside of SoFi when we got in. And it was like we were all related. Like we all like <laughs> just like I love all <laughs> these people. So, and it was fun. My cousin actually came from Utah to go see it. And I was able wow. to meet him. And it was just like. It's like, I'm not even just like trying to overhype it, but it's just transcendent. And I would say that most people who've seen the tour have said similar things. There's some really funny like reels and (laughs) memes on Instagram of like people after they get home from the concert, like you can't stop singing it. You can't stop thinking about her. Like it's incredible. Yeah. My fiance saw her at SoFi top of the stadium which i heard wasn't the best as far as sound goes but came home just blown away and then it was beyonce on all of our speakers for at least weeks on end i was like okay it's fitting so so much good music i mean how do you not listen to all of it exactly i'm really happy that she's on board she was on board (laughs) now i know with both the film coming out and whatever everyone's going to compare beyonce and taylor swift right Yes. And they shouldn't. I don't think so. Because it's two totally different artists, histories, all the rest of it. Yeah, I agree. As far as the movie goes, did you see both documentaries? Did you see? I did. Of course I did. I had to. Because I didn't go see the Taylor Swift concert in person because I'm not that diehard. And it also seemed really like it was the way that ticket process went, I was like, I don't need to be a part of that. Like, it was already difficult with our yeah. Beyonce ones. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I did see it, and it's good. It's it's good. She's talented. She has diehard fans, but they're the way that Beyonce uses the concert, but then weaves in behind the scenes. But it's even more than that, you know. Like she like. Also, the editing is superb, like the way she cuts from like going through the flow of the concert to then talking about the Renaissance album and how her uncle Johnny inspired it. Like I learned stuff I didn't know at all about her and I know a lot about her. And you also like see more up close stuff with her family and then how the fashion was such a big part of it. And she talks about that. And it's just like woven in so seamlessly. And it always, you know, she's a very private person, yeah. her and Jay-Z. So when you get like a window into their world, it just feels like such a treat. And you know that a lot of thought and care went into it. So, and also it's clear that a lot of thought and care went into the album, let alone the way the concert is. So being able to like really be immersed in that more fully is like really for any fan or even any new person, like my husband came with us to see the film because he didn't go with me to the concert. He was like, wow, you know, he was very impressed. Whereas with Taylor, it was just the tour minus a few songs for the length. And you don't really get that like inside look at her, which she's done before, right? There's Netflix, Apple kind of documentaries you can watch, but it's just not quite the same. And then even, I don't want anyone to get mad at me, but Beyonce is just like such an incredible performer. Like she starts her show with the ballads. I just think that's the best like boss lady move is she's such a talented singer. She's such a commanding performer. 
She doesn't have to come out and hit us with crazy in love. Like she just takes us away with her voice. Whereas I think, you know, Taylor Swift, and I think she knows it. She's not the best dancer, but she's charming. She like does fun, playful things, but it's just not, it's just not the same. And that's why I agree with you. I don't think it's a totally fair, equal comparison. Yeah, I mean, I knew some Taylor fans who were like, what is Beyonce doing releasing a doc at the same time? And knowing how it goes by, there's no way that she heard through the grapevine. She's like, Taylor's got one. I'm going to make one. That's not how things are made, right? And I've tried to explain to people. I'm like, please, again, years in the making for these things and all the plan that has to go into it. It's it's apples and oranges. And I think you just pointed out why. Yeah. Getting in, seeing that personal aspect and a little more of where the album came from. It was not what the Eras tour thing was. It was not. And I think Beyonce has a history of like, you know, the homecoming documentary was her performance at Coachella. And it was a similar style where it like, cut back to the making of the show. And she she's a very visual artist. Like even when her second album, not every song's a single. There's like a music video for every song she makes. She's she's like always filming and recording things. And I don't know, I don't know as much about Taylor as I know about Beyonce, but it's definitely on brand for her. And I got to tell you, we are all waiting for the live album. Like we (laughs) want my Renaissance vinyl live so I can lay on my floor and just have my moment. (laughs) And we hope 2024 or 2025 brings it. We hope so. (laughs) Well, I mean, yeah, Renaissance was number one album in 2022. The movie itself as of you know a couple of days ago was at 43 and a half million worldwide fans are seeing it people are loving it she just yeah. continues so what is next for her obviously a live album is there uncharted ground or is she just going to keep doing what she's doing she's definitely going to keep doing what she's doing but she's also keeping us a little in the dark because when renaissance came out she said this was part one of a part oh. three situation so but some, some fans are like, is the film part two? I've had the feeling that Renaissance is its own part one. And then part two is going to be a whole different album and whatnot. But yeah. it's hard to imagine because actually in the film, she says that the tour was four years in the making, oh which gosh. kind of blows my mind. Like, I thought this was like her pandemic baby like creativity brainchild but I think it was more than that so I don't know I wish I knew what was next because I like I'm always I'm just always itching for more Beyonce so we'll wait on uh, with beta breath for the next Beyonce announcement two of three yeah I hadn't heard that one of three things so it's really done it is long it is long so you gotta prepare yourself and have go to the bathroom and have some snacks. And it's crazy because even though I saw the tour, I even watched it on Instagram Live another time. <laughs> and there I forgot. Like there's just so many good sections. And then when we were watching it the first time in the theater, I was like, oh, it's almost over. No, it was not. There were still like two more like whole sections of songs. I was like, oh yeah, this is a jam-packed situation. So buckle up. It's I mean, do you feel like it should have been cut up and made a docuseries? Well, you just said the IMAX was totally worth the experience, right? The IMAX and the momentum, like you're exhausted at the end in the best way. Like it's so exhilarating because it's just like so many good songs, such the dancers are incredible. That's another thing you get with the film too, is You get to know some of the dancers and part of her like band and the crew. It's really a wonderful group that puts this whole tour on. And, but it's just so much energy. I think a docuseries would not be able to like maintain that energy. They just got to buckle up. Buckle up and watch it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, it's got to be, I'm going to guess your, your favorite music movie or documentary, right? Yeah. Yes. That's very fair to say. Let's talk about your 311. Three favorite movies. One that you loved that somebody else hated or, you know, was kind of panned. And then one that you loved that most people haven't seen and you want to kind of get out there. Okay. 
So three movies I love are, I'm going to do a two for one, the Let's Sister Act movies. Yeah, fantastic. Two for one. You can't have one without the other. But if I had to choose, I think Sister Act 2 is my favorite. Those movies just take me to another place. I also love the film Chocolat. That's like a blanket to my soul with Johnny Depp. And it's just a great film. And then a newer film that I really, really like is so fun is Polite Society. Did you see that one? It was so good. I it so like good. makes me so happy. It was so fun. Almost like an Edgar Wright movie, but not and British. And it was such a blast. Yeah, I love that one. I like I recommend that one to anyone. Oh, a movie I love that everyone hates on would be Crossroads starring Britney Spears. Okay, wait, what? Have you not seen Crossroads? Never seen Crossroads. Okay, listen. I think it gets knocked when it shouldn't. Like, Shonda Rhimes wrote it, and it's, like, actually a really good story. (laughs) The music is good. And Zoe Saldana's in it. You know what I'm saying? It's not, like, it's not a weak film. And it's definitely got some cheesiness, but Britney's great in it. But I think people are just like, oh, Britney Spears in a movie? Don't knock it till you try it, okay? Yeah, I mean, I had to pull it up because I'm like, who's even in this cast? Justin Long, Dan yes! Aykroyd. Dan Aykroyd is her dad. See? I did not know he played Britney Spears' dad. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Kim Cattrall is her mom. Fantastic. So. Yeah, what a cast. Okay, is this one you saw in the theaters when it came out? Is this something you discovered recently? No, no, no. Let me tell you this. Whilst loving Beyonce, I also am the prime target demographic for Britney Spears, who yeah. arose at the... I was in eighth grade, I think, or maybe seventh when Baby One More Time came out. So I've been holding hands with her through time. So when the movie came out, I could not, it came out in February. I remember that. And I was like, I can't wait to see this. And it was also at the same time. Do you remember the movie, A Walk to Remember? Oh, yeah. More? Okay. So that one was out. And my friend, like, we'd seen it multiple times. So they didn't want to see Crossroads. They wanted to see A Walk to Remember again. So I went by myself. And the theater was full. I was like closer to the front. And I sat next to these two. Like construction worker guys. And it was okay. kind of close because I was like, I know why you're here. And that's gross. And I'm like 16 or 17 years old, but I loved it. So I, I loved it. So I went and saw it by myself. Like that's where we're at. And I have dedication. On- yes. <laughs> I still have it on DVD. That's amazing. All right. Crossroads 2002. I mean, I wonder if it's streaming. I don't think I've ever come across it. So. You know what? I don't know if it's streaming either because when I showed it to my little brother who clearly has the same taste in music as myself, I brought my DVD to Utah. I said, young man, it's time for you to watch Crossroads. <laughs> the re-education. Yeah. <laughs> this is important. Amazing. Oh, and the last, what's the last one? One that you like that no one has seen. Okay. I'm pretty sure. a few sure. people have seen. I'm not, this is the one I was talking about that I drove to Pasadena to go see. Okay. It's called The Dressmaker, Kate Winslet. Okay. And I think it's because it's, I think it's like an Australian movie. But I also think it was produced by Amazon. But her love interest in it is Liam Hemsworth. And it's set in Australia. But it is such a good movie. And I feel like no one knows about it. Yeah, and it's never heard so, of it. like, funny. It's like this woman who comes back to her hometown um, and, like, repairs her relationship with her mom. And her mom is hilarious. And it's kind of this cast of characters. And while she's looked down upon, kind of as, like, kind of like a, like a, <laughs> She's like a hoe, but she's not. But there is like she like knows how to make these beautiful dresses. So she dresses a lot more like um, sexily and they just all hate her for it. But it's such like a funny, heartfelt film. And the end scene is like one of the best. And I'm just going to spoil it. 
but Must she ends up like setting stuff on fire. So the last scene is like her leaving the town with this huge fire behind her. And it's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a really good movie that I think more people should see because I think they would love it. And I think I've seen it. I think it is an Amazon film because I've usually seen it on Prime. Like, I don't think you'd have to really pay to rent it even. So, yeah, I wonder if Amazon produced it or just has distribution rights. But oh, yeah, I just pulled it up. I was like, oh, I've never heard of this. And it is on Prime, free to watch. Yep. And Kate Winslet, Liam Hemsworth. And then I saw Hugo Weaving. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. You, yes. Okay. So, what's on the list? I think you watch that with your fiance because she also, I think, will really enjoy it. Yep. All right. Adding it to my list. What have you watched recently in theaters or streaming that you've really loved or that surprised you? Um, I got a couple things. We saw Iron Claw. Oh my gosh. Just saw it last night. Oh, how are you feeling? Um, <laughs> my friend and I both cried through multiple parts. We're just like, we're just not going to talk about it. It's just so good. It's so good and it's so sad. I think Zac Efron is so good in it. He's amazing. I didn't know. I mean, I just didn't know. Like, I don't know. He really, he really got me. And I love the end scene. I liked how they like ended it on the most positive way that they could. Yeah. Yeah. I loved it. And then I also saw the color purple last weekend. Okay. How was that? I really liked it. I've never. It's shocking. I've never seen the original film. Same I've here. never seen the musical, yeah. um, you know, on Broadway or anything, but I really enjoyed it. It's also very sad, but it ends strong. And Fantasia is incredible. <sighs> and it's a musical, right? So there's. It is. Okay, so, so it's fun the fact. adaptation of the Broadway musical. Gotcha. So not a direct remake of the original movie. Right, exactly. Um, fun fact, right before interviewing you, I just interviewed the sound mixer on that movie, <gasps> who also worked on Maestro and Star is Born and oh, La La Land no. and Transformers. Yeah. So just before this, we're talking, I'm like, oh, what should people see? He's like, oh, Maestro, Color Purple, Wink. And I was like, wait a second. I knew he did Maestro. And then he had to like cue me in. He's like, I also did Color Purple at the same time. Wow. So it was kind of fun. He said it was a challenging one because he tried to catch onset dialogue and singing. Yeah. Um, which is cool. Wow, that's so cool. Oh, I love Color that. purple. Yep. So I recommend that. And I also watched this is old. I don't know why I never saw it before, but a Tom Petty documentary about him making the Wildflowers album. I watched that on. I don't know what I watched it on. I started watching it on a plane, so then I had to finish it. <laughs> then you had to find it and finish it. And that was really good, too, because I'm a big Tom Petty fan. So I do enjoy a musical-based musical doc. documentary. Yep, they're hard to beat. And Tom Petty, yeah, I have never seen that one. I used to watch, maybe I've seen part of it on MTV Classic or something at one point, mm-hmm. but... I recommend it. It was good, because that's an amazing album. And I just yeah. love, like, I love feeling like I'm in the room watching magic happen yeah you know when they're like recording or writing songs and figuring it out so there's it's a lot of that it's footage that's never been seen before that was made while they were filming or while he was creating the album with like rick rubin and some of the um heartbreakers and yeah it's cool have you seen the beastie boys documentary no okay i think it's on apple still I watched it, I think 2020. I guess in a screener. Okay, so it's the two surviving bandmates in a theater, just like riffing, obviously not riffing, but it looks like they're riffing, just talking about things. And then it dives into all this old footage and the music and Rick Rubin and everything. I mean, it was so good. I've never laughed more in a music documentary. But, anyways, really? That's one to check out. And then, are you a U2 fan? Oh, yes. I love it. Okay, did you watch the David Letterman, the Disney yes. one they did? It was so good. As soon as it finished, I'm like, I need this version of every song. I just yeah. want that album. I listened to it on repeat for way too it's long. So, I, yeah. I, the slowed down, all I want is you. Like, the, oh, I just love it. <laughs> so, so, so good. Yeah. I'm into well, it. Megan, 
Thanks for coming on. We're going to have to talk as more music stuff comes out. Any Beyonce news you're going to be on. Thank you. Um, are you trying to watch everything before the Oscars? I don't know if I can. I feel like I'm behind. I want to. Yeah. But are you? I I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. But yeah, there's enough like zone of interest. I'm like, oh, man. It's going to be heavy. I just haven't set aside a heavy night yet. It is. And then Anatomy be. of a Fall I haven't seen yet. So there's some of those ones I'm a little little behind on. Yeah. I got to make a plan to see yep. if I can achieve that goal. <laughs> <laughs> well, we still got a little time. Thank goodness. <laughs> well, thanks again for coming on, and we will catch up again soon. Thanks. So what did you end up watching last week? Well, I ended up getting COVID last week. So I've been in bed doing nothing but watching TV <laughs> for like days. I ended up watching Saltburn. Let's and talk about wow, it. Wow, what a movie. I obviously, I think, I think some of the things had been spoiled for me just, you know, by being on the internet, everything from the bath scene to the grave scene. Still, I, you know, I think it probably horrified people, you know, because... I listened to this podcast where the the host was saying that, you know, he's surprised that people are talking more about the bathtub scene than they are about the grave scene. And he said that, that he thinks that the reason that is, is because people can imagine themselves doing the bath, the bathtub scene. Okay. And that's, what's horrifying about it is that no one in their right mind would do the grave scene, but there's a, there's a fraction of the population that would do the bathtub scene. And that's, what's horrifying about it. <laughs> That's a shocking theory that is shaking me because there's something so gross and visceral about like, I just think about germs or whatever else. And it's like, that's nasty. And then you watch it and to your point. You're like, oh, someone might have done that before. That's pretty someone, nasty. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but the, you know, the cinematography I thought was fantastic. The writing was good. It was pretty ethereal and like, didn't, didn't hold your hand too much to like explain what is happening in the movie. And I thought, you know, they did a good job. Yeah. I mean, did, who stuck out to you as like the star other than Barry Kogan? I mean, obviously Jacob Elordi. I mean, I know yeah. the, the world is obsessed with him. Who's, who's his, his dad character? Who's what was oh, that uh, Richard E. Grant? Yes. Yeah. He did a good job of playing a really like detached, eccentric, but also destable or, or unstable rich guy. Like yeah. that final scene where they're having breakfast in the room when the curtains are being drawn. I was just like, this is, this is unhinged. And he and, did a really good job of playing into that. And yet you kind of know people like him, right? I sat yeah. there, I'm like, this was someone like my friend's dance. You go over something crazy happened. And they're just like, no, we don't talk about it. Get back to business. Yeah. Feeling nothing. Even when it is insane, <laughs> I just couldn't. <laughs> that was that was one of the most uncomfortable scenes in the movie for me. Yeah, and I loved Rosamund Pike and her character. It was so again, I feel like accurate to so many people I know of. Just like, oh wow, appearances, catty chatter, just a very interesting look at a human. What a good movie! Maybe yeah, not great, movie. maybe not everyone's favorite, but it was a good movie. It was a good movie for sure. I definitely like. I, I'm sure it should win some awards. It shouldn't win the biggest awards. You know, yeah. I want movies that are a little bit more optimistic about the nature of human life. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Well, I was going to say, have you ever seen Talented Mr. Ripley? I have not, no. We're going to spoil Saltburn for all those who haven't seen it because you know what? Deal with it. It's been out long enough. Go see it. We won't spoil everything, but I will say, I just watched Talented Mr. Ripley like three months ago. Matt Damon, Jude Law, Gwyneth Paltrow, Philip Seymour Hoffman. It plays on, it's, it's a similar story on both of a person who is getting in with rich and affluent people and using them. And then later you find out a little more of his backstory and it colors what you've just seen. Right. So while I was watching it, once it hit a certain point, I was like, oh, it's the other movie, which isn't bad to like say it's a similar plot line or whatever else. Yeah. I think it was a good retelling and especially like for the current age. Well, <laughs> current enough age mm -hmm. i'm still a little frustrated with the whole like 2006 like do we have to go back in time i don't think so um, yeah i think the only thing that did in saltburn was like you couldn't look him up on facebook and know exactly where his family was that's like the only thing i thought about with that 
Yeah, I know that's true. I feel like I, I feel like I read an article where maybe Martin Scorsese or one of the, one of the big time directors of his caliber were bemoaning the fact that stories are less interesting because of smartphones, because we just know people's location and we can just communicate with them instantly that there's no more like, there's no more tension that can be built and so you, you like you need to find ways to place stories in 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 places and contexts where technology doesn't either exist yet or work in the same way, so that you can manufacture that drama. Which is kind of sad. But then you sit and you look and you're like, how many times do you dream about a phone? Like it doesn't ever happen, if at all. Yeah. You know. So like e- even our own versions of storytelling internally are like, oh, we can't deal with this. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, I'm glad you liked it. And what else did you watch last week? Well, I I watched Matrix Four, uh-huh. which I should have watched when it came out, but I just never got around to it. I thought I thought they did a good job with it. You know, I think I've, I've definitely have read some of the background where Warner Brothers was like, "We're going to make this with or without you," to the Wachowski sisters, and you know, they or at least one of the Wachowski sisters came back and said, "Okay, fine." fine if you're you know we might as well do this if you're going to do it without us and then have you seen it tristan oh yeah i saw it in theaters and it was a a shock to me but also yeah. like i understood what they were doing and to me i mean uh, yeah you good <laughs> just the you know the original trilogy was just it was such a kind of a, a contribution to culture in a huge way in terms of action movies you know the slow-mo fight scene like you I challenge you to watch any action movie between 2000, 2000 and 2010 and not have some kind of a bullet time thing yeah. be, be featured. But then matrix resurrections is so much a meta commentary on Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> and they like, they don't even lampshade it very hard. They just like, they call it out in the first act of the movie where the, you know, the original trilogy is a video game within the series. And like, you're, we're seeing projections and of like the original movies and like the characters are commenting on the, 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 the events of the first trilogy as if they're like this cult, this like kind of cultural myth and that they're all borrowing from. And it was, it was like really jarring. It was very different than the original trilogy, but it was, I thought a really good commentary on the fact that Hollywood will just like bring things back from the dead for the sake of money. Yep. <laughs> and I can't believe that like, you know, Warner brothers got called out by name in the movie and they just let that go to, they just let it go. They just let it happen. Yeah. They let themselves like not only be the butt of the joke, but it was so self-aware. It was like, wait, how did the script get through this? And I yeah. think they just knew that it was going to be one of those cultural, cultural touch points when it came out, but also for us to look at years later and be like, Wow, that just that just called it all out. That did it. That was, you know, <laughs> yeah. the meta commentary was the movie. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the agent the new Agent Smith character, I forget that actor's name, who's been in everything. Anyways, just the fact that he's having the conversation with Keanu Reeves as Neo, just like, Yeah, you work for this company. Yeah, we're gonna do another big one. Oh my gosh, it's back. Like, we gotta make more money with the sequel. It just was so in your face. <laughs> I know, at least in my theater, there were so many people groaning about it, like, oh my gosh. And afterwards, the comments from like, that sucked. That wasn't a Matrix movie. And I was like, no, that was a Matrix movie. (laughs) The Matrix movie was breaking you out of the Matrix of going like, why do we keep asking for things and not just let sleeping dogs lie? Oh, yeah. We create the same machine that we get frustrated with. Yeah. And then, you know, to have the analyst, crap, what's his name? He's in How I Met Your Mother, that guy. Neil Patrick Harris to have Neil yes. Patrick Harris's character, you know, be like, yeah, I'm a machine and we've discovered a new way to like do, to do the matrix where we just, we put people even more asleep and we make them miserable and somehow they love it and it produces more energy for us. And we just like, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, that's, that's just kind of a really good commentary on, I mean, I know that like the original matrix was like, there's so many different ways you can interpret that to be about capitalism, to be about, you know, whatever, but this, this, this new version where it's like, you know, if we just let them believe in, in, or make them, no, no, no he said fear and desire was like the, the two polarities that created this new version of the matrix that like doubled their power output or something. 
if we make people afraid to lose what they, what they have and give them just enough hope for something better that that tension enable, like makes them not be able to do anything. And I'm just like, Oh shit. That's like the way the world is right now. <laughs> that's exactly what's happening. Yeah. Say what you want about the Wachowskis, but I'm like really not pulling any punches here. And no. I do appreciate that. It was just like, even in moments where it did make you grind your teeth a little bit, it was mostly because it was factual and accurate. And you're like, Oh yeah. Sad. Yeah. I mean, I, the fight scenes, I think were not nearly as good as they were in the yeah. original trilogy. Like, especially some of the editing, um, the editing, you could tell that like, you know, Keanu Reeves is probably really, I mean, he's obviously really good at fight scenes, Yeah, but whoever the new agent Smith character was, was clearly probably not a good, sorry, the, the dog in my house is barking, not as good at the fight scenes. And so the fight scene between him and him and Neo in the middle was just kind of like pretty lacking to me. It was, it built around a lot of edits and I don't know, it just kind of fell pretty flat, but I will say I kind of liked how it ended. It ended in a way that kind of made it so that picking up and doing another sequel would be very difficult to do. And thank heavens. <laughs> thank heavens. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that, you know, I remember all the chatter once the cast was announced. They're like, oh my gosh, they're doing a Matrix 4. Yaya, Yaya Abdul Mateen, who was fantastic in, I want to say he was, yeah, he was in the new Watchmen series, right? Yeah, he was, yeah. So good. Jonathan Groff, who played Smith, also fantastic. You had Jada Pinkett Smith back. You had Priyanka Chopra Jones. You had all these people that are like up and comers or big names and a couple of returning people. And it was just like, oh my gosh, here we go. It's going to be the next Matrix trilogy. And then to watch it and go, oh, they've punked us top to bottom. Of like, <laughs> let's bring in some great talent. You're like, they're going to be the new Morpheus. They're going to be the new. And you're like, Okay, well, actually, it's just to remind you to maybe, like, let the hopes down. These people are all in on it who signed on, Neil Patrick Harris included. And that's good. It's a good note to be like, stop asking for the next sequel. And I think they did that, because I don't know anyone who saw it who's like, what about Matrix 5? Like, Well, I mean, you know, it kind of speaks to part of the idea between like the in-universe idea between resurrecting Neo and Trinity was that you can't let them, you can't let them touch. Like you can't let them get so close, but you also can't not have both of them there together, yeah. which created this in narrative like tension that if you ever let it resolve, you're not going to have any more power or you're not going to have any more story. But if you don't have them, you're also not going to have power or story. And I thought that was a really good commentary on the fact that we don't let stories end anymore. Yeah. Like there's always, there's always something unresolved so that our stories can just continue. And to end the movie, literally talking about, oh, well, maybe we'll just put rainbows over everything. And then having them fly, fly off screen holding hands is just like, oh, no, they're just going to let them have a happy ending. And then that's going to be it. Because once there's a happy ending, there's no reason to go back to it. And it reminds me of there's a Jack Johnson has a song where I'm a Johnson fan or anyone who's listening. Jack Johnson has a song where he talks about how he's got this line where he says that he rewrote the second half of his story so that his protagonist could find his way back home. And I think about that all the time where it's like, why do we, why do we make our characters miserable in the end? Like, like let's, let's write our stories so that our characters can, have happy have a happy ending after everything traumatic that happened to them and that is you know we do that in a way at least in the, the matrix resurrections did it in a way so that we can't pick the characters back up again we can let them be at peace yeah it's funny because i know a lot of folks would look at like a marvel and be like see marvel is the reason Mar marvel just keeps bringing their characters back they're probably going to bring back iron man or cat there's all these things that could be happening just because marvel is the biggest series yeah but it's not just them look at how many james bonds we have look at how many mission impossibles we have or how many times a character rides out into the sunset to come back to the same exact problems they had before we just yeah. love we love to do it because it's from a business sense, secure. And I think also for the audience, there's a comfort in the character you know and a fear of having to learn something new. And so we just keep asking for the same thing back and back again. So to your point, Absolutely. I hope we yeah. can just let... No, I'm, let, I'm a part of the, the be done. Yeah, let them be done. Let them be happy. Let them fly around and throw rainbows over everything. 
Yep. Well, so, so you've you been you've been you've been watching Masters of the Air. Yeah, I went to the early pre-screen, which was at one of the theaters here in Los Angeles, with the executive producer and then four members of the cast. Now, I will say, when I got the tickets, they were pitching that Austin Butler and Barry Hogan were going to be there with the cast, and they were not. It was, it was the night of the Critics' Choice Awards, and I was like. I think this theater knew what they were doing by just saying they're going to be there to get more people. The line was down and across the block. It was hundreds and hundreds of people trying wow. to get in here. So they moved it from just two episodes to three episodes. So they showed the first three episodes of Masters of the Air. And for those who are not, I know we mentioned it last week, but Masters of the Air is the spiritual successor to Band of Brothers in the Pacific. It's the Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks combo limited series. And unlike the last two, it's not on HBO. It's on Apple TV+. Plus. So it follows the same format, I think, as the other shows of where the first episode's kind of a slow slog you're getting used to the characters it does follow the book as far as i know pretty closely the the biographies and books that were written about this you know division this air division that's just flying bombers in the european theater but that said it's fantastic the cgi is a little lacking in places where you're like oh this is streaming cgi it's not it's not great (laughs) but beyond that it's action-packed They don't cut corners inside of the plane. They're really bouncing around, bumping around. It does get a little bloody here or there. And you care about everyone so quickly that when anyone dies or when you watch a plane explode next to the the main characters, you feel for them. And you're like, wait, that's their buddies. That's their friends. And they're really playing up the emotions and the loss more than just, hey, we bombed an ammo depot. It's more so like... Our COs are idiots, and we're losing our friends out here just for the sake of bombing in the middle of the daylight. That's crazy, which is a good critique. I love the idea of like not just the, the valor or honor of soldiers. It's more so like the brains and the emotions of, wait a second, we're losing people, and is this unnecessary? Yeah, it probably is. So really good. First three episodes are great. I'll keep watching. I'm going to try and stay ahead with our screener site so I have an idea of what's coming every next week. But so far, so great. Right on. That's cool. Are you watching anything else next week? I am finishing up Silo. I'm on the final episode. Have you watched it yet? No, I have not. Rebecca Ferguson. Okay. Add it to your list. I love it. And I've been so addicted. I've watched it so quickly. But I'm a little afraid the last episode might throw me for a loop because some of the people I've talked to have said, I don't know what the final one. So we'll see about that. And then this week, I want to start The Curse, which is that movie with Nathan Fielder, Emma Stone, and Benny Safdie. So that kind of looked fun, and I know I'm a little late to it, but it sounds like a good time to do it. It's a little cold outside still. What about you? I need to finish For All Mankind. I'm on the final season. That was a binge during being sick. So I watched watched three seasons in probably three days, honestly. How long are episodes? Uh, They're like an hour. Ten episodes each. So like, I didn't leave my room for a few days. Um, (laughs) So I need to, I'm going to finish up uh, the final season or season four. I don't know if it's the final season, but I'm going to finish up final four season four this week. Now I have gotten two episodes in and then I paused to finish silo. What do you love about for all mankind? I I love hard sci-fi, you know, like I, I, I love the expanse and this kind of feels like, I know it's not an in-world prequel to the expanse, but it, you know, so it's an alternative history where Russia beat the United States to the moon. And then because of that, the, the, the space race never stopped. And so the United States and Russia are constantly trying to one up each other. And so there's, uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of the story is, is borrowed from like just the Cold War tension. And I like kind of the the way that they explore that. But also man versus space is just such an interesting, fun story concept because space is like one of the hardest things that humans could possibly do. And it's a fantastic antagonist where it doesn't have a face and it's not malevolent. It's not malicious. It's not evil. But it is also one of the hardest things that that humans have to learn how to face. And, 
you know, it's a, it's a fantastic antagonist. And so when you are having stories where characters need to go to the moon, where they need to go out, like simply going outside is itself a challenge that it just adds such an interesting complication to any story that I, I just, I just really like it, especially in a world where, you know, in star Wars and star Trek space isn't necessarily an antagonist anymore. It's a setting. And so I like stories where space is a little bit of an antagonist, kind of like in interstellar docking, Mm -hmm. just docking your ships was very dangerous. And, uh, you know, in kind of bigger space sci-fis, you don't even think about docking your ships, but just simple, something simple as docking is framed as this very dangerous thing. And I really enjoy stories that, that, that kind of lean into that aspect of sci-fi and for all my can does a really good job of that as well as the human stories are incredibly compelling. They have a great cast of characters and every, you know, all of them have just got great, great human, human stories that are just really kind of compelling that are the through line on top of the, on top of the, the great sci-fi storytelling. I feel like that's a tough balance there, especially with some movies in the past few years, like Ad Astra or others, where I was like, they may have nailed one side or the other at times, but not the whole thing through. So I'm excited yeah. to start it. And we'll have to talk next week about how the uh, fourth season wraps up. No, we will. We'll, we'll have to talk. Well, watch more movies, finish that up, and we'll talk next week. Perfect. Thanks, Tristan. 